you open up your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we're going to continue in our series this month on discovering your purpose. As you're turning there, say this with me, I have a purpose. Thank you. I believe that each one of you have a purpose. It's not just a pastor has a purpose or a president has a purpose. Every single one of us has a purpose. And as a matter of fact, there's no small purposes or big purposes. We all individually have a purpose, and God is going to judge us by those things that we do in our purpose. For example, God is going to hold Billy Graham. Does anybody know who Billy Graham is? Okay, the great preacher of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. God is going to hold Billy Graham accountable to the purpose he gave him. He's going to say, Billy, did you do the things I asked you to do? Now, he's not going to hold you accountable to the purpose he gave Billy Graham. He's not going to say to you as a mother, did you go to 20 countries and preach to 100,000 people and tell them about Jesus? He's not going to hold you accountable to that. He's going to hold you accountable to your purpose. And when we get up to heaven, there's not going to be, you know, big purposes and little purposes. There's only going to be rewards for those who faithfully fulfilled their purpose. So let me give you an example. Let's say Billy Graham. God told him to go to 20 countries and preach the gospel to 100,000 thousand people. He did a lot more than that, but let's just take that as an example. But let's say Billy says, I'm only going to go to 15 countries, and I'm only going to preach to 50,000 people. Now, you might say, I've never been a missionary. I've never done anything great like that for God. But if God told you, I want you to witness to your coworkers whenever God comes into the conversation. I want you to invite your family to church, and you do that all the days of your life. You're faithful to it. Everybody say faithful. You stand before God, and there's you and Billy Graham. You will get a greater reward than Billy Graham. You're all looking at me like I'm crazy. Because you fulfilled your purpose. It's the same sense of when we give our tithes and offering. Everybody say a tithe. Thank you. A tithe is 10%. So you may have a millionaire come here, and let's say they just got signed to a a basketball team or a baseball team, because if those guys are living in our city, I'd rather them go to this church, amen, than be at the bars or anywhere else. So let's say a baseball player comes, or a football player, or an entertainer, or somebody like that, and and they just signed a deal, and they got a million dollars. Now, what would be their tithe, 10%, to give to the Lord out of a million dollars? $100,000, right? But let's say one of these young people right over here, their, their parent, family, parents, this weekend, gave them $20 for an allowance. How much would be a tithe off of $20? $2. So let's say that, that person who just got that million-dollar deal who owes the tithe of what? 100000 comes in and gives $95,000 to the church for the sake of the gospel. And they're just so happy and proud. They maybe pull me over to the side and say, Pastor, I've got a great big check to give you in the church. You guys can get a lot of new things. And, and you know, he, they make a big deal out of it, and they give that $90,000, uh, $95,000. Were they obedient to their tithe? No, actually, the Bible says they're still under a curse. But let's say one of these young people, just quietly, nobody paying attention, takes their $2 bills out of their pocket, straighten it, out, you know, straighten it up. It's all been crumpled up in their pocket. They put it in there, and they just give it between them and God. Are they blessed? Are they blessed in a greater way, according to the principle of tithing, than the millionaire who gave 95000 Why? Because they were faithful to their 10%. 10% is individual. It is what is your 10%. Give that faithfully to the Lord. And think of the same thing with a purpose. God is going to hold you accountable to your purpose. Were you the mother, the father, the businessman, the lawyer, the school teacher, the student? Were you the person God asked you to be? Was I the pastor over 100 people like he asked me to be? Because I'm not going to be held accountable for 3,000 people. I'm going to be held accountable for 100 people. Is everybody tracking with me? Now look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and have that in mind, because that is the purpose of this series, is for you to discover your purpose. And it says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Continue reading, please. Who have been, keep going. I want you all to read the whole thing like you're in school. I'm going to start again. I'm going to take, if you don't have the NIV, read it right up here. And we know that in all things God works for those who love him. Keep reading.
to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? If God is for you, who can be against you? When God gives you a plan to do, nothing can come against that plan from coming to pass. I want you to get that in your heart today. Everybody look up at me, please. When God gives you a plan, there is nothing that can come against God's plan. As a matter of fact, any problems that you're facing in the future, God already foreknows and has a solution. There is not a problem that you face in life that God has already not given a solution for. When we look at the word impossible, we can look at the word I am, the great I am of the Bible, I am possible. Because every situation you face, like we talked about a few weeks ago, is father filtered. Just like water goes through your faucet and filter before it comes into your, into your, uh, you know, into your water cup or whatever you're drinking. Everything in your life has to go through the father. And the Bible says that he foreknew who you would be, what situations you would face. And he predestined a plan, a calling for you, that it would work out for your good no matter what you faced. And when he is for you... Nobody can be against you. Now, the moment I say that, there is a sense of relief to many of us, and we feel this confidence that God is for me. But for others, the moment I say this, you have a question that comes into your mind. If God is for me, why do I suffer? If God has predestined and planned my life, why has my life been full of pain? I don't know about you, but that's a question that I ask quite a bit, especially when I hear a verse like we just read. And so I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 6, verse 9, as I continue in our series with today's message, Why We Suffer. Do you want to learn about that today? Do you want to learn about the why we suffer? So many people think suffering is a p opposition, the opposite of God's plan, that if God truly loved me, I wouldn't suffer. That if God truly had a plan for my life, I wouldn't face hardships. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 6, verse 9, as it's starting to get really real right now. Because it's easy to shout on Sunday. It's harder to live it out on Monday. It's easy for you to say, I'm going to trust God with my life when everything's going well. But when things start going wrong and your faith is tested... We heard a testimony, at, that's another story. We heard a testimony at the beginning of our service. It wasn't a testimony of God healed the young man, the child. The testimony was my brother died and God provided for the funeral. How many would like a testimony like that? I don't think a lot of us would come to the altar call saying, God, show me your faithfulness to provide by taking my son out of this world. As a matter of fact, most of us, if we lost a child, the first thing that would come into our mind is a big question. Why, God? Why would you allow my child to suffer? Why would you take my child off of this planet? If you have the whole world in your hand, and if all things are working for good, and you foreknew the problems I would face, and nothing can be against me if you're for me, why would my child die? My mom buried my sister about 10 years ago. My sister Jenny died drinking and driving out in the suburbs, hit a pole going 70 miles an hour, flew through the top of the roof of her car as it split in two. Watching my mom go to the junkyard and seeing the car in pieces and her scavenging through the, the, the car for trinkets that my sister had hung from her rearview mirror or glove compartment to remind her of her daughter was the saddest moment of my life. And the question that came into my mind is probably the same question that's come into your mind when you faced hardships, is why do we suffer, God? Why couldn't you just made somebody at the bar stop my sister from getting into that car? Why, why didn't you, you know, put something at the end of there, maybe a lake or something that she wouldn't have run into the pole? 
So many here during the recession lost your job. I remember hanging out with friends on $70,000 boats on Fox River. These wonderful, extravagant boats. And they would just talk about how good life was and had a $100,000 mobile home to take the boat all over the, the country. Lived in a multi-hundred thousand dollar home. Business was exploding and expanding. And when I would hang out with them, it was just in the lap of luxury. And as the recession hit, they had to lose their mobile home. They had to lose their boat. They had to close down their company. And in tears, he came to me saying, I don't even feel like a man anymore. I've been a Christian my whole life, but I feel like God's abandoned me. Sometimes we go through trouble and we ask God, why do we suffer? If you're for me, why do I suffer? Peter, I believe, answers that question so well. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. If you're there, say, I'm there. Welcome to a church that tells you as a T-I is, as a tis, amen? We're not here to tell you a lie to make you feel better. Would you want me to lie to you and make you feel better? Or would you rather me tell you the truth, even though sometimes it's hard to hear? But I'm going to tell you something. You will feel better, and God will bless you, but we got to deal with this tough question, don't we? Listen to what 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 says. In this, you greatly rejoice. Okay, what is in this? What am I going to greatly rejoice in, Peter? Getting a raise, getting a promotion, a new baby being born. What am I going to rejoice in, Peter? Though now for a little while, you have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Peter, have you lost your mind? Peter, what are you smoking? What is wrong with you? You, you want me to greatly rejoice that I'm having to suffer grief? And not in just one kind of trial. It's something if you're just facing, even as bad as it is, a funeral. But then to be facing a funeral, financial trouble, family trouble. Doesn't it seem in life that when it rains problems, it pours? That you face all kinds of problems and they bring you grief? And yet I'm told here by Peter, I'm supposed to rejoice. And, and not just rejoice, I'm supposed to greatly rejoice. I'm supposed to have a Holy Ghost party that I'm going through grief and all of these trials. Keep reading, verse 7. These have come. What are the these in that sentence? These are the all kinds of trials that cause grief. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You mean what I'm going through has a purpose even in my suffering? Yes, and what is the purpose? That God gets glory. And you might stop and think to yourself, I don't want to give glory to God that way. I want to give glory to God on payday. Glory to God. I'm so happy. I'm blessed. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But I don't want to give glory to God God, when I just got fired. Thank you, Jesus. I lost my job. Don't know how I'm going to pay my bills, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. I don't know if anybody praises God like that here. That's kind of like back in New Orleans, like a southern woman. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Just the southern bell for Jesus. Oh, yeah, we don't, we don't want to praise God. On the days we get fired, we want to praise God on the payday. But yet the Bible is saying that when things go wrong and cause us grief, there is a faith that is being tested on the inside of us. And when we stick with it and don't give up, we give glory to God. You might say to yourself, how dare you, God? How dare you test me that way? Some of you have been given a life where your parents were the abusers instead of the protectors. And God may be saying to you today, I'm testing your faith. And by you going through this situation and growing up and having a different kind of family, you're giving me glory. And you may want to say back to God and shake your fist, God, how dare you get glory out of me that way? I don't want to give you glory that way. Keep reading. Verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. 
Has anybody ever felt that inexpressible, glorious joy where God makes you so happy you just can't express it? Sometimes there's tears of joy. I know I have, so I know God's real even though I don't see him. I've, I've felt him. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I want you to stick with me just a little bit more through this tough question before we get to some answers. So if we look at the Bible, we actually get an answer, but it may be an answer that we don't like. It's an answer of suffering is protesting and producing a pure faith for the glory of God. And we may feel back to God, this is not the kind of life that I chose. I want to ask you, what are some of the things that you're suffering today in life? What are some of the things you've gone through that have just literally like broke you in half? Or the way I like to put it, you know, when tragedy comes, it feels like somebody just steps back and just punches you right in the gut and it just takes your breath away. It's that quick. And sometimes in life you can't get your breath back. It feels like you're trying so hard just to become normal again. It just, it just, I just can't feel like I, I, I can get my breath back. This, this hit me so hard. I don't know how to recover from it. I also like to compare it to having a precious vase. And, and it's like sometimes tragedy, hardship comes, and it breaks the vase in a million pieces. And that vase is so valuable. It, it means so much to you. And, and you get on your hands and your knees, and, and you're trying to put it together. You know, maybe you had a plan for your future with retirement and a job, and, and you had it all together, but it just looks like it's been crushed into a million pieces. And you're just saying, come on, God. God, how does this make sense? How do, how do I glue this back together? together again God is saying to you in the midst of this I'm here and as you're being punched in the gut with life and your life is being broken into pieces you're saying God if you're here why is it I don't see you changing my circumstance if you're here why is it I don't feel you and I believe that all the answers in the world, even though I believe the Bible gives them, and I'm going to start giving them right here, but I want you to track with me right now. I believe that all the answers in the world will not give you back your breath and will not put together your heart and your life again. Because unless you can believe that Jesus loves you, no answer is going to fix you. Stop and think about this. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. He's working all things for my good, and he foreknew the problems that I would face. He predestined, called, and glorified, justified me through these things. And I can say, if God is for me, who can be against me? What I want you to see today in the Word of God is that suffering only has one real hope, and that is the hope of Jesus Christ. Today's message, I want to give you some things to encourage you through your suffering, through your trials, through your tests. But I want you to understand those answers will not heal you. Only Jesus will heal you. And when you have faith in him, he will transform the perspective that you're having. So when we look back to the example of my mother burying her daughter, what does her testimony become? Jesus walked with me through the valley of the shadow of death. What happens to that person who was brought up without a father and who was abused? Their testimony becomes God has become a father to me and every good and perfect gift comes from him. You begin to get a testimony through the process of your problems and through your suffering that God is bigger than what you face and he's able to work it for your good. Even if today while you're suffering... You don't see it. I have a video I want to play for you, and then it's going to start to get real good. Somebody say, preach it. Amen. This video is going to do that for me. Guys, would you put that up? Thank you very much.
The presence of evil, pain, and suffering in our world is the most persistent argument raised against the belief in God. Bye. Usually, it goes something like this. Put your hands up now! An all-knowing God would know evil exists. An all-loving God would want to prevent evil from existing. An all-powerful God could prevent evil from existing. Here, but yeah. evil does exist. <laughs> now, given that the fourth proposition would appear to be undeniable, it can be inferred that one of the other three must be false, and thus there cannot be an all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful God. Checkmate. Or at least some people think that. However, not too long ago, an American philosopher named Alvin Carl Plantinga put forth a new proposition that is intended to demonstrate that it is logically possible for such a god to create a world that does contain evil. This is how he summarized his defense. A world containing creatures who are significantly free and freely perform more good than evil actions is more valuable, all else being equal, than a world containing no free creatures at all. Now, God can create free creatures, but He can't cause or determine them to do only what is right. For if He does so, then they aren't significantly free after all. They do not do what is right freely. To create creatures capable of moral good, therefore, He must create creatures capable of moral evil. And He can give these creatures the freedom to perform evil and at the same time prevent them from doing so. C.S. Lewis would agree, saying, Imagine a wooden beam became soft as grass when it was used as a weapon, and the air refused to obey me if I attempted to set up in it the sound waves that carry lies or insults. But such a world would be one in which wrong actions were impossible, and in which, therefore, freedom of the will would be void. If the principle were carried out to its logical conclusion, evil thoughts would be impossible, for the cerebral matter which we use in thinking would refuse its task when we attempted to frame them. Continuing his defense, Plantinga says, As it turned out, sadly enough, some of the free creatures God created went wrong in the exercise of their freedom. This is the source of moral evil. The fact that free creatures sometimes go wrong, however, counts neither against God's omnipotence nor against His goodness, for He could have forestalled the occurrence of moral evil only by removing the possibility of moral good. So, even though God is all-powerful, it is possible that it was not in His power to create a world containing moral good, but no moral evil. Therefore, there is no logical inconsistency involved when God, although wholly good, creates a world of free creatures who chose to do evil. Come on, somebody say, that's deep. See, there's an explanation, isn't there? Now, as a matter of fact, I believe that that explanation is a very sound theological explanation. It's found in the Bible. But how many now feel, if you came in here with suffering, how many of you now feel inexpressible joy and glorious peace right now? How many, just by hearing that, get to feel inexpressible joy? Let's be honest. That doesn't make you feel inexpressible joy, does it? But in the... The scripture that we just read with Peter, it says that with our faith being tested, that we're receiving the goal of our faith, which is salvation, and we are to be filled, look at it, with inexpressible and glorious joy. Did that answer from the philosophical person, Alvin Plantica, did that give you that joy? It might have answered a little bit of your questions, but it didn't result in joy, did it? Why is that? Because true joy comes from salvation in Jesus Christ. And you have to see God's story of salvation. When we say, like, like Ricky was talking earlier, that God brings you salvation, some of you just think God wants to save you from the lies that you told. You have a very shallow definition of what salvation is. So here you've done a couple bad things in your life, and now God's going to save you, and he's just going to change the bad things you've been doing. It's a very shallow definition of salvation. God is not just saving you from your sins. God is saving you from your sorrows, your sicknesses, death itself, and the punishment of hell in eternity. And by saving you from those things, he's giving you another life called eternal life. And in that eternal life, you're supposed to be living in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be coming on this earth as it is in heaven in your life. And you're supposed to be filled with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
It's a lot more than just saying, God saved me from telling lies. Because sometimes we think Jesus is a savior who just remodels our lies and kind of puts band-aids on us. My friends, when you get to understand what salvation is, and I'm going to share it with you, salvation in Christ alone will give you all the peace and joy you will ever need through whatever situation you face. When you get to understand how much Jesus loves you, what he did for you, and how he is using the things of your life to be for his good and for your good in eternity, there will be no temporary suffering that will take the joy away. Let me just give it to you like this. There's people in heaven right now, is there not? How many believe there's a heaven? Is there not people there right, right now? People who have already passed away, people who have died? Let me ask you a question. Do you think in heaven right now, those people who are there care about March Madness, the basketball thing going on in college? Do you think they care about that? Think about that. Heaven, the Bible says, is a place of great joy, a great peace, a place where we dwell in the presence of God. Do you think right now they're concerned about sports? Do you think they're concerned about who's going to win American Idol? Think about that. Do you think they're concerned about whether or not um, Boulder, Colorado got fresh snow so that the resorts could be open this weekend for St. Pat's? Do you think they're thinking about skiing, going to resorts? Why do you think they don't care about those things? Because everything they need is found in God right now. They have an awareness of what reality really is, and what used to be their reality is no longer reality. It was actually more of just a fiction. It was more of just a distraction. The Bible actually calls this life that you and I are living in a mist, a mist, this is not the reality of what you were created for. You were created for eternity with God. Now try to get a con conceptualization of what eternity is. Eternity, time without end. So now imagine the greatest joys, the greatest pleasures that you could ever have in this life, things that you may care about, shopping, money, raise, a house, all of those things, those things are going to pass away. Those things will end. And in comparison to how long you will have a house, how long you will have a job, how long you will have a car, in comparison to heaven, it's just a mist. It's just a vapor. So people in heaven today understand that what you and I are going to, to find joy, whether it's to go out and celebrate St. Pat's downtown or to go to a resort or watch basketball, these base level momentary pleasures that we try to go to to hide our pain, people in heaven understand it's like trying to grasp mist. There's no substance to it. No substance in alcoholism, no substance in education, no substance in just family reunions. You can have family reunions for 100 years, but there is no substance in it. Because where they are right now, the substance of joy is in the person of God. Now, what is salvation? Understanding that now. What is salvation? To be saved from your carnal way of thinking. To be saved from what we messed up in the garden. The garden of Eden, we were with the substance of joy and of happiness. We had God in our midst. They knew not that they were naked because the glory shone around them like a light bulb, just like you can't make out the writing or the brand name on these light bulbs because of the illumination. They didn't even notice they were naked because the glory of God shone through them. But when they were given a chance to choose that or sin, they chose sin the light went out and paradise was lost and the world as you know it became this world and in this world people are seeking for that substance that Adam and Eve lost and one person put it like this we all have a God-shaped hole on the inside of us that only God can fill and so when we go to our job it doesn't satisfy us even in marriage, if you think marriage made people happy, why do people keep getting divorces? 
If sex made people happy, why aren't prostitutes uh, the most happiest people you know? Because they get to have sex all day long and get paid for it. If achieving great things like education made people happy, why aren't people with PhDs the happiest people you know? If having power and, and a, a polit political gain is supposed to make you happy, why is it political people aren't the happiest people you know? Why is it you can meet people who are happy living in a one-bedroom studio apartment with three kids? Why? Because they found a joy that has a tangible substance in God, and they find more happiness in that than all the treasures of this world because the things of this world are just a mist. Now you put that together with suffering. What is our suffering? Our suffering is the pain we feel while we're in transition from the paradise we lost to the paradise we gain in Christ. In this time we call life, we are being tested to make our choice. And when we feel pain, it actually shouldn't make us shake our fist at God. It should bring us to our knees and say, thank you for saving me out of this mess and promising me a better life. Pain and suffering should actually bring us to Jesus because it reminds us that everything here is just temporal passing and fleeting. That only Jesus satisfies. I remember one time hanging out with my friend and he had a bracelet that was made by his girlfriend. And, and he was wrestling around and, and the bracelet broke. And he took up this bracelet. It was like this moment that I can't believe this guy had because I'm like, dude, you're a tough guy. But he started getting a tear in his eye. And he picked up the bracelet. And he said, why is it everything that I love in life breaks? Why is it everything I value in life, it breaks? See, I was a sinner back then. I didn't know how to answer him. But I would answer him today. The reason why everything breaks is because we're away from God. But God promises to heal the brokenhearted. He promises to heal and restore us. And what he puts together, nobody can tear apart. What God says is good, nobody can curse. What God says will live, can never die. It's supposed to show you that everything breaks because we're not with our God anymore. We're separated from him. We don't have his cell phone, his Twitter. We don't know where he's at, but he's telling us down here to have faith in him. And when things break and we have faith in him, it gives him glory. And in return, he gives us inexpressible and glorious joy. That's how he set it up. He set it up through those times of suffering that we could have the greatest experiences with him we ever could imagine. As a matter of fact, there was a professor one time to prove this point to his students. He said, on one side of your paper, I want you to write down the three hardest times you've ever faced in your entire life. And these students went and they started writing out the hardest times of their life. The time I lost my mother the time that I lost my job and my house. And they, they wrote down those things. And he said, now, turn over the other side of paper and write down the three times that you experienced God's love more than you ever had before. And as they flipped it over, they already started getting the lesson because they said, the time I lost my mother, God healed my broken heart. That time that I lost my job and I thought I was going to quit on life, he provided for me. They realized that the hardest times they faced walking through that valley of shadow of death was the closest that we, they were to God because he promised in those times that he would pick up the sheep and that the rod and staff would comfort them. Did you ever notice that? It, it, the whole time, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalms 23, he's just hanging out with the sheep. But it's not until... The sheep faces the valley of the shadow of death that he gets picked up in the arms of the shepherd. You know the story of footprints, right? Why is there only one footprint, God, through the times that have been the hardest of my life? Did you abandon me? No, those were the times I picked you up and carried you. Salvation is not just something that we should look at with a base, shallow definition. We should see the greatness of our God. And what salvation entails, it entails our past, present, and our future. Look at the story of suffering here real quick. God created Adam and Eve free to choose good or evil. 
as the video was showing, Genesis 2.17. What did Adam and Eve freely choose? They chose evil, did they not? And because Adam chose evil, evil brought sin, suffering, and death to all mankind. There's nobody that escapes from it. Now on the cross of Jesus Christ, he says, and turn here with me, Isaiah 53, verse 5. Everybody turn there with me, please. Help me preach this morning. How many want to help me preach? Somebody say amen. Come on, turn there with me to Isaiah 53, a prophecy about Jesus 600 years, 600 years before he ever came to earth. Does everybody know what a prophecy is? A prophecy is something that is foretold that people said what happened, and then it happened. So that means what you're going to see right here is that it was foretold 600 years before the time of Jesus what would happen to Jesus and what he would do. If you're there in Isaiah 53, can you say, I'm there? Now, the whole entire chapter is a powerful chapter. And matter of fact, if you're ever trying to show people about how awesome Jesus is, read this to them first, Isaiah 53, and then ask them, when do you think this was written? During the life of Jesus or before the life of Jesus? And most people will say, this had to be written after the life of Jesus because it talks about him going to the cross. And then blow their mind and say it came 600 years before Jesus was ever born. Somebody go, oh, snap. Come on, look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. Well, you know what? Let's just go to verse 1. We're going to honor this passage right here. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 2, he grew up before them like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to detract us to him. Nothing in his appearance we should desire him. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Why was Jesus familiar with suffering? Because he took on your suffering. What did the Son of God suffer? He had everything he ever needed. But when he came to this earth, he became familiar with your suffering. Oh, come on, Jesus. Like one who men hit their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Now look at verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities, our sicknesses, and carried our sorrows. He carried our sorrows. That means every tear you've ever cried, he's carried. Problems you have never even gone through yet, he's already carried. Somebody needs to be encouraged this morning. Problems you have not even faced yet, he's already carried the tears that you're going to cry. Just think about all the tears you're going to cry in life. Let me depress you for a minute. Let me depress you for a minute. Do you know that all of us, should the Lord tarry, are going to bury our moms and dads? I don't know about you, but I got a great mom and dad. Think I'm going to cry some tears that day? How about Bethany and Hannah back there, my kids? What do you think it's going to be like the day they bury me? You think they're going to cry some tears? God's already carried their sorrow, though. He's already carried the sorrow I'm going to face on that day. He's already meeting me there. He's already saying, Joe, don't worry. I'm going to meet you there. And all those tears you're going to cry, I've already carried them. That gives me hope. He said he carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. Verse 5, here's where it gets just so pinpoint accurate. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace. Everybody say peace. Thank you. Was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. Yet the Lord laid on him the sin of us all. How many are happy today that Jesus carried your sin? How many are happy today that Jesus carried your sorrows? How many are happy today that Jesus carried your sickness? God created Adam and Eve. This is the creation of the world, freely to choose. They chose evil. Evil came to this earth. Jesus came to destroy evil. He died that we might live. Now from this point forward, from the time of Jesus to the time we live, God uses suffering, according to 1 Peter 1.6, to build our faith. When Jesus comes back, suffering will be no more. Revelation 21.4, and I'm going to end with that in just a moment. 
But I want you to see now the twofold answer of why we suffer. Can somebody say, answer the question? There's two reasons why we suffer, friends. That's because of the consequence of sin. God allowed it so that when man would fall into sinfulness, he would see his need for redemption and relationship with God. If sin and separation from God had no consequence, we would never feel we needed to turn back from God. If I did not discipline my daughter when she tries to run out into traffic and grab her as a young child and say, don't do that, and to spank her and to put into our mind, you don't want to do that, then at some point she could run out and suffer the consequence and know not what she does. We are spared, think about this, from hell itself by the roadblock of our suffering. The roadblock of our suffering, imagine you're trying to go down a road, the bridge is out, and they put up a roadblock. The bridge is out. Now, if you go past that, and you keep going, and you fall off into the ditch, into the river, that's your own fault. Are you tracking with me? The road map, the signs that are on the path of life that are telling you that there is a hell, there's an eternal separation from God, are the pain and troubles and trials you're facing. They are to get you to wake up, put on the brakes, and say, I need God. God in my life I need God in my life because no matter how much money you have you can't stop from going off that bridge sometimes people say to me I don't believe in all that God stuff you know I believe in making my own way and doing my own thing you know what your parents are still going to die you're still going to face economic hardships you're still going to be on a deathbed, possibly with amnesia, not remembering yourself, drinking out of a straw, and somebody changing your adult diapers, your pampers, your depends. You see, denying God doesn't take you out of the world of suffering. You will suffer with God or without God. But suffering with God draws you closer to God. Why? Because the other part of the answer is it teaches us, number one, the consequence of sin. And the second thing is, it's for the glory of God. See, the glory of God enabled us to have a choice. He did not want to make robots like the video was sharing, that when we were about ready to make a bad decision, God didn't slap Adam and Eve's hand and say, I won't let you do it. No, he says, you're adults, you can make your own decision. But he didn't allow them to die and go to hell the way they were. He sent his covenants, he sent his word, he sent Jesus, so that through our own mistakes, he still looks good. He's a good God. He receives glory when we put our faith and trust in him, and when he works all things for our good through our suffering. Now, I want you to think about this. Think of the greatest tragedy, tragedy you've ever faced in life. Whatever that may be, for me, losing my sister, watching my mother, right? That's my biggest tragedy. If the biggest tragedy, or let me say this, if the biggest pleasure of my life is but a vapor, right? If making the most amount of money, having the education, having a family, building a big church, house, whatever. If that's a vapor because it's in the system of this world, is not my greatest tragedy a vapor as well? Come on, think about this. Think about your greatest tragedy. Now ask yourself this question. How will that compare to eternity? Is your greatest tragedy, the thing that makes you want to shake your fist towards God, is that worth your eternal happiness with Jesus Christ? Are you willing today to doubt in this plan and what God is saying because of what you might have suffered? And it might have been real suffering, and it might have been despicable. Even as a child, I mean, I look at the suffering of this world, and it breaks my heart in a million pieces. But listen, my friend, those of you who might have been abused or given hardships in life, listen to me very carefully. If you now take this suffering in your 80 years of life, and you hold it back to God, and you shake your fist in his face... You will miss eternity with him. And so what is the great deception? The devil's called a liar. Why? Because he tells lies, right? Let me ask you a question. Those of you who are here, if I was to want you to believe a lie from Satan that would cost you your eternal soul, would I come and tell you a lie, something like this, um, you know, if you worship the devil and put 666 across your head and tattoo a pentagram, 
you're going to have a magical unicorn in your backyard tomorrow. Do you think many people would deny God, put a you know, tattoo on their forehead, go through the whole deal so they can wake up the next day and find a unicorn in their backyard and go fly around on this magical unicorn? But what if the devil came to you like this? God doesn't care about you. The problems you're facing is evidence that God's not helping you. You're going through life alone. All this pain, all your problems, there's nobody to help you. That sounds like a more believable lie to me. And if you shake your fist towards God, you'll find more happiness here. You don't have to go to church on Sunday. You can go to the ball game. You can save your money from the tithe and take your children to Walt Disney World. Do you know that these chairs are empty because people believe that lie? There are people suffering today in life. They are going through the hardest parts of their life, and in their mind, they can't come here because if they come here, they feel they're just going to be playing make-believe with God, raising up their hands to a God that doesn't hear, giving their money to a church that doesn't do anything for them. So they might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because they could do more to fix their own problems than some imaginary God in the sky. And yet they don't understand that's his deception. His deception has now blinded their minds that to where the pain and all that they're facing in life is supposed to actually bring them to God and ask the Father for help. It's actually driving them away from God. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and the moment they knew they were naked, what was the first thing they did when they heard God come? God ain't going to understand. That snake is going to understand more than God because the snake, you know, he told me if I did this, I would be powerful like God. And I don't want to face God right now. And I'd rather to go back and talk to that snake and have him help me fix this mess. And I don't want God to see me like this because if God sees me like this, he'll probably put me into a plaid place and I'll never be able to get out. They trusted the snake more than they trusted the creator of the entire garden. And they hid from God. But you know what God did when he found them? He clothed them. And he said, I'm going to provide a child through a woman that will crush the serpent's head. And Jesus, born of a virgin, came and crushed the serpent's head. What does that mean? It means the evil that the serpent brought into the garden that day, that we hid from, the the God that we were afraid of because the evil we had done. Jesus came, put one hand in heaven, the other to the gutter where we were, and brought us to where we needed to be, and he crushed the head of the devil. That means today suffering, sorrow, and sickness has been defeated by Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about this as we get ready to close out. There's two explanations that Christians have to how God works this all out. And you've heard me mention it before, and it's Calvinism versus Arminianism. One was by John Calvin. The other one was by Jacob Arminius. Around the time of the Reformation in the 1500s, as we were breaking away from the Catholic Church, these Christians got into a debate How does God rule the world and make all the bad we go through work for his good? So they started with the premises that I just shared with you right here, that God's a good creator, that Adam and Eve sinned, that Jesus took away our sins. When we put faith in Christ, we're saved from our sins and sorrows, and one day in heaven, there'll be no more. But they came from two totally different angles. And I don't want you to think that Calvinists cannot be Christians because there's good Calvinists that can love God and do things for the Lord. But their doctrine, their belief, is from the pits of hell. And it's determinism, or another word we would say is fatalism. As they began to describe the Christian worldview, starting with the idea that when Jesus died on the cross... He didn't die for everybody. He only died for those that would choose him because he didn't want to waste any of his blood. They began to teach something called limited atonement. Think about it. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for everybody. 
because he knew only those who would choose him in the future. So when he died on the cross, he only died for those he knew would choose him in the future. So this idea is God's controlling everything, and really Jesus doesn't love the whole world. The Calvinists can't sing this song. Jesus loves all the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight because they believe that because God sees the whole picture, he only loves those who eventually choose him, and the rest of them he hates. And they use scriptures like Romans where it says, Jacob I love and Esau I hated, and they twisted it to meaning that God loves some people right now, he hates some people right now, and the choice has already been made. You don't believe me? I have all the notes here. I won't mention their names because I don't want to be considered to be doing that on a Sunday. But I'll just tell you, this is a famous Calvinist. You know what he said? He said, what we deny is that all men are intended as the beneficiaries of the death of Christ. He said, we deny that all men are the intended beneficiaries of the death of Christ. As a matter of fact, he goes on in this same article to say, he, Jesus, did not die for all men in the same sense. But there's another way. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, John 3.16. And we believe what the world is, is the whole world. Another way to look at it is man's nature. Because God knew, according to them, that Adam and Eve would sin, and God has everything under his sovereign control, they began to teach that it was actually God's will for Adam and Eve to sin so that God could become that much more glorious. So God was sitting in heaven saying, how do I teach a creation about my love and mercy? Well, I'll cause them a lot of pain, and then they'll love me because I'll take away the pain. And they taught that man is a sinner because God willed and ordained it. You say, oh, there's no way they could say that. Oh, they say it, and they say it even better than that. One of the famous Calvinists says this, God wills righteously those things which men do wickedly. Famous Calvinist today. He said, God willed righteously what you see wicked men do. You see Newtown? God willed that. God wanted that to happen so people would see how good he is. John Calvin even said it like this in his own words. He said, therefore, if we cannot assign any reason for his bestowing mercy on people, but just that it so pleases him. He said, we can't come up with any other reason to why God loves some, hates others, other than it just pleases him. Neither can we have any reason for his reprobating others, but by his will. When God is said to visit with mercy on some and harden others, men are reminded that they are not to seek for any other cause beyond his will. That means when you see people doing good things or you see people doing bad things, the Calvinist said, you don't have to ask if that was their will, that was God's will. When Hitler did what he did, that wasn't because Hitler wanted that to be done. God wanted that to be done. And when you see a Mother Teresa, that's not because she wanted that to be done. That's because God wanted it to be done. Fatalism. What will be, will be. That's what fatalism, Sarah, Sarah. But there's another way to view it, that man is sinful because of his own choices. That Hitler did what he did, not because God forced his hand or made him to do it, but because he chose to be that kind of person. And because God allowed us to make our own choices, like a parent allows their own adult child, God allowed us to make our own choices. The next view is, how does God give grace? The Calvinist says that when God gives you grace to save you, that it's irresistible grace and that you can't resist it. So when he says, you're coming to my house, he doesn't give you a choice. He drags you along. And if you try to resist, you can't. An irresistible damnation. If you're not being drawn and dragged to the Father, you can't on your own effort come to the Father and you will never be able to because he didn't bring you. You're damned by his choice, and you can't change it, and you are saved by his choice, and you can't change it. Another one of the famous writings from a Calvinist said this, the doctrine of irresistible grace means that God is sovereign and can overcome all resistance when he wills. So if God wants you to go to hell, you're going to hell. 
And if he wants you to go to heaven, you're going to heaven. Said another way, new birth, talking about being born again, is the effect of irresistible grace because it is an act of the sovereign creation, not of the will of man, but of God. So that means if you see somebody born again, it's not because they freely chose to come follow Christ. They were forced into a relationship with Christ. But there's another way. Grace in the Greek, charos, actually means gift. And I don't know about you, but I don't think God's playing mind games with us that when he gives a gift, we can give it back. Because if you can't give a gift back, it's not a gift. Are you guys tracking with me? It's like somebody whipping you saying, that's my gift to you. No, if I can't deny that gift and say, no, you can hold on to that gift. I don't want that gift of being whipped. It's not truly a gift, is it? You look at the Bible in Ephesians 2.8. It says man is saved by the grace of God, the gift of God, but it comes through his faith, his choice in choosing God. Man has a choice to either resist God or obey God. So those who are in hell are because they resisted the free gift of God, not because God willed it and overcame them and sent them to hell. And those who are in heaven are not there because God put a fish hook in their mouth and drugged them. It's because they were freely choosing to serve him. I'm preaching better than you're shouting, but that's okay. I came to church this morning. And the last thing when we talk about salvation is that the Calvinist wants to believe that salvation, once that person is saved, they'll always be saved. And when you understand these other points, I mean, that just makes sense because if God's ultimately in control and if he only died for them and he drags you in and you can't uh, deny his grace, well, then, of course, there's no way out of it. You're stuck. And it's the same thing because if you're not saved, you're stuck in damnation. Does the Bible teach that? Absolutely not. The Bible teaches that every man can fall away, shipwreck his faith, and return to sin. Turn there with me quickly to Ezekiel chapter 33. And I want you to see it in the Bible as clear as it can be. Do I believe that you should be afraid of losing your salvation? No, but I believe you can lose it if you so desire. You have a choice. Just like when I offer you to come to my house, you can leave my house at any time you want because it's a gift, it's an invitation. I'm not making you my slave. Look at Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, the prophet gives a very clear warning in verse 13. This is what he says. He wants him to tell the people this. If I tell the righteous man that he will surely live, but he trusts in his righteousness and does evil... None of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. He will die for the evil he has done. If you just read that with me, can you say amen? Did I not say that in the Bible? That if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and starts doing evil and then he dies, he will not be remembered for his righteousness. He will be remembered for the evil he's done. So now I want to ask you a question. And I want to, get your, I want to ask you some questions. I want to get your response here quickly in closing today. I want you to look at these and answer them honestly, not because one is right or one is wrong. I just want you to, as much as you know about God and as much as you've heard about him and preached, answer what you believe accordingly, yes or no. Number one, do you believe God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to die for the sins of the whole world? Do you believe that? I know I do, right? I believe that. Do you believe men are sinners not because of God's will but because of their own choice? What makes a man a sinner? Is it God that said, I'm going to make you a sinner? No, it's man's choice. Do you believe people can freely choose, like you, your neighbor, your mom, your dad, your friends, your children? Do you believe people can freely choose to either obey or disobey God's commands? Yes or no? I believe that. And lastly, do you believe Christians today, those of you who are Christians, do you still believe you possess a freedom of the will to either stay with Jesus or walk away from Jesus? If you said yes to those questions, then you agree with the Bible. You agree with the prophets who spoke in that Bible. The heart of Jesus, when he spoke to people, he never demanded or forced them. You agree with the good news, the gospel that the apostles wrote about in the New Testament. And you agree with the history of the church because for 1,500 years before John Calvin ever came around, this is exactly what we believed. Deuteronomy, turn there quickly with me. Chapter 30, verse 19, ties it all together for us today. 
Why do we suffer? Because man has sinned, and it shows our consequence, and it gives glory to God. Here is your choice today. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says it very clearly. This day, God speaking, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death. Everybody say life and death. He's given you the choice, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Does God give you a choice? In a world of suffering where things seem to go wrong and you see death, does he give you the choice of life? He does, and he wants you to choose. What does he want you to choose, y'all? Life. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land that he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then quickly turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Just to reiterate the point one more time. Why do we suffer? Because of the consequence of sin and to the glory of God. What do we do about it? We get saved. We call upon Jesus. We see that in the midst of our problems, God is doing something great. The same author that we started the book with in 1 Peter now closes out his second letter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8-9 through 9, gives us the hope that we're to have as Christians who may be suffering in this world. Do not forget this one thing. Everybody say, don't forget. Band, would you come, please? Come on. Don't forget, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. How long ago was Jesus on this planet? How long ago, y'all? 2,000 years ago. How many days has that been in heaven? Hasn't been that long in heaven's, in heaven's calendar, has it? You ever gone away for the weekend? Jesus just went away for the weekend, y'all. He's coming back. He said, don't think he's being slow. In heaven, they're on a different time than we are. Some people who died, seriously. 2,000 years ago. Peter, disciples like that, you think they're up there right now going, man, I've been here so long. They're like, man, it's only Saturday night. I just came here on Friday. It feels just like the weekend. So what is the encouragement? What is God telling us? What God is telling us is be patient. Be patient. He's going to make everything new. Remember that scripture in Revelation I told you I was going to read? Here it is. Revelation at the end of the book, when we all get to heaven and the judgment is over, he says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. This was just a test, baby. Look at your neighbor and say, it's just a test. Say, don't look at your other neighbor and say, don't get scared. It's just a test. See, God is asking us, where do we want to go for eternity? Do we want to deny him, get away from him, or do we want to accept him and live for him? He said, on that day, all the pain is taken away. The mist of this life is taken away. And the substance of God is forever ours. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Would you stand up and give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you believe it today? Come on, thank you, Jesus. Can somebody say thank you, Lord? We thank you, Jesus.